This is an incredible passage of Scripture. It was an absolute joy um, to dig into it, and I look forward to to sharing it with you. But first, uh, let me open with a word of prayer. God, thanks for this day. Thanks for the opportunity to support. Um, I thank you for what you revealed to me. I would ask that, uh, that you use me and what I've come up with, that uh, it might bless um, those in the congregation, wherever, uh, wherever they are right now um, in life. Uh, certainly, we have to deal with uh, <clears throat> death and what is to come. And so I would, uh, would ask that uh, you just uh, go before me, that uh, my words be wor- you, your words, and that most of all, um, that uh, all I say and do would glorify you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am First Corinthians chapter five. If you'd like to follow along, um, this is a passage of scripture that I really feel like uh, probably should have. This easily could have been two messages. Um, there is enough. Uh, when I first started, <clears throat> excuse me. When I first started looking at this, and I knew the title of the sermon, so I knew what the focus was, and it's, it's on this first part of it. But I absolutely love the second part of this. It's one of my favorite passages in Scripture, and I'll get to it when I get there, but I have my kids, uh, my students, memorize um, this back half of chapter 5. So there's a lot here, so let's dig in. I am going to uh, begin Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. I will read the first 10 verses, and this is a section that um, in your Bible, in the ESV version, is marked our heavenly dwelling, and so there's, some, there's definitely some good news in here, so let's have a look at this. <laughs> For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, and we walk if not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the Lord and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we- sorry. Um, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So, the Bible has a lot to say about what's to come, but not enough for most of us, right? I mean, it's, uh, I think most of us, myself included, would like to know more about what's to come, what's on the other side. But we, we are told in Scripture. Um, I was reminded as I was studying this, and I'm thankful that it's not as big of, of a deal um, as it used to be, but um, there used to be... Uh, it was an entire genre that you could find at the Christian bookstores. I, I refer to them as heavenly tourism books. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that kindly. Um, the books, people who supposedly have died and went to heaven and come back. Um, I'll just say right off the top, I don't believe them. Um, I, I can't imagine why you know, 2,000 years after Jesus was here, that uh, God is sitting up there and says, man, I wish I would have told them this about heaven. Oh, wait, no, I have an idea. I'm going to have somebody die, and I'm going to go up there, and then I'm... So it, I, I've never been a fan. I believe that there is enough in Scripture. God has taught us uh, and given us enough information that we, we can know enough, and that's enough. So um, I didn't mean to step on any toes. If you like uh, those... <laughs> Types of books, um, okay, I'm just not a fan. So, but there is 
uh, lots to say about it. In fact, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, there's quite a bit of that section that's about, about this. But this particular passage, these first 10 verses in chapter 5, is one of the Bible's clearest teachings on the intermediate state. That is, the period of time between a Christian's death and when Christ returns. Um, this is the time when a, when a Christian is in the awkward position of not having a body, and he refers to this. Um, and this awkwardness is what Paul explores in this passage for the Corinthians' encouragement. And yet, um, even when we are in this intermediate state, it's not Paul's main point. It, he does refer to it, but it's, it's not really his main point. Um, his main point is the rea reality um, that in the course of talking about something much better, and that is our final resurrection body. Um, and that is good news indeed. No matter where you are in life and what you have gone through or are going through, um, that perfect resurrection body. Um, and as I get older, and, and I, look, I'm old, I get, some of you think I'm a kid. Um, I get it. Uh, that doesn't change the fact. I'm 63 years old. I'm way closer to my resurrection body than um, most of the people in second service will be. But So, <laughs> not saying anything about that. Honestly, once upon a time, I wasn't sure I fit in here. I fit in here now. So, um, But that reality of the resurrection body is something that we can all look forward to. Uh, so throughout this passage, Paul uses two images of, of houses and clothing. Um, his overarching point is that every successive stage in a Christian experience is superior to the one we leave behind. So whatever is still to come, you know, this is what we know. And there are sometimes we get so caught up in the world and we love living in the world so much because it's what we know and it's our comfort zone. Um, but the reality is that every successive stage in our life, this being the first of the three, um, unless Jesus comes, and actually Paul talks about that, and is actually Paul was hoping that he got to skip the intermediate state and go straight to, he wanted to be alive at Christ's coming, um, and he explains that in this passage. Um, I would absolutely love that as well. But each successive state is better um, by far. So it is superior to the one we leave behind. Um, so you have the earthly life, which is where we all are now, then the intermediate state, and then the final resurrection. So in last week in the passage that uh, Patrick did on four, you had, um, we have this ministry. It was in 2 Corinthians 4.1. And then um, in 2 Corinthians 4.7, we have this treasure. Um, later on in in 4.13, we have the same spirit of faith. And then finally now in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, we have, we have a building from God. So um, Paul's testimony uh, on the reality of the Christian faith, Paul is absolutely excited about um, the, the Christian faith. Um, so this building from God that he's talking about, it, it's... It's not the heavenly home. It's not that type of building, um, I don't believe, um, based on my studies. It's actually the glorified body. So he starts out initially. Paul was a tent maker. And so uh, Paul, not surprisingly, used the, the tent here as a picture of our present earthly bodies. Now, the thing about tents, if you know, if you've ever spent the night in a tent or... Um, Honestly, even if you've ever seen a tent, um, they are, they're fairly weak. Um, I remember we used to camp um, when I was growing up, and um, I remember when it was raining, the, um, they were pretty waterproof until you touched them. <laughs> I always thought that was fascinating. I always had to touch it when it was raining. I, it's wet paint, I, I don't know, um, but... They, when you touch them, then all of a sudden it start dripping, and I usually get in trouble for that. But, um, but the tents, they're weak. They're, they're temporary structures, right? You put them up and you take them down. Um, and honestly, they're without much beauty. 
I don't think I've ever seen a tent that I'd say, wow, that is a, that is a really pretty tent. Um, and so the glorified body that we have to look forward to will be, it'll be eternal. It will be beautiful. Um, and it'll never show signs of weakness or decay. Is there any of us that can't look forward to that? Um, there is, uh, I'd been asked <laughs> both by Matthew and Gage this morning if I needed other scripture put up. Honestly, I have enough that I just, the distraction of going back and forth, but I will reference some other things. Um, if you want to know more about, um, you know, the, the body not showing weakness or decay, there's in the in, uh, Philippians, um, there's some good stuff in there about that. Um, so I will refer to other passages. I'm just not going to go read them. Um, that's in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Paul saw the human body as jars of clay. We learned that last week, right? In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and as a temporary tent. But he knew that believers would one day receive a wonderful glorified body suited to the glorious environment of heaven. Um, and so it's interesting to trace Paul's testimony um, in this paragraph. Um, I love how this begins. Um, first Second and third word, we know. Um, I love in Scripture when it says we know. This is not, Paul's not hoping about this. And therefore, we don't have to hope about this. This is clear from God's word. We know. And how do we know this? We know it because we trust the word of God. We don't have to, um, we don't have to have a medium or a fortune teller. We don't have to... Um, None of that stuff to find out what the future holds. Um, nobody's my like lifeline or whatever that is, I think, in my hand. Um, we are given enough information about what lies on the other side of death. Um, God has told us all that we need to know in the pages of Scripture. I said earlier, um, I absolutely believe that. Um, and his we know... Um, ties back to the previous chapter as well and relates to the resurrection of Jesus. We know that he is alive, therefore we know that death can't claim us. Um, as John 14, 19 says, because I live, you also shall live. So once our tent is, or if our tent is taken down, um, we need not fear. The body is only the house we live in. When a believer dies, the body goes to the grave, but the spirit goes to be with Christ. And again, this was from Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Um, so the moment of our death, um, we've had that experienced here in the body over um, the last week or so. Um, the moment our tent gives out, um, we are with Christ. Um, and then when he returns, um, he'll raise the dead bodies in glory, um, and body and spirit will be joined together for a glorious eternity. Um, continuing on in this passage, he talks about groaning. We groan. Um, when I read that, I could not help but uh, be reminded of the groaning in um, chapter 8 of Romans. Uh, he talks about groaning as well. And so... When, when he talks about groaning in this, he, Paul's not, not desiring death um, necessarily. Um, he is, in fact, it, it rather is the opposite of this. He was eager for Jesus Christ to return so that he would be clothed um, with the glorified body. He presented three possibilities of what could happen using the body as a tent. Um, you're either alive and you are residing in that tent um, you are dead, so unclothed or out of the tent. This is where the term naked came from in that passage. And then finally clothed, the transformation of the body at the return of Christ. Paul was hoping that he would be alive and on the earth at the return of Christ. Um, if you read scripture, it's clear. And part of it was because uh, of some of the things that Jesus said. But they, all of them were hoping and expecting and we should live our lives as well. Um, expecting. Sometimes I think because it's been 2,000 years, 
Um, and it may be another 2,000 years. Don't see how, um, seeing where um, the world and culture is going. Um, but we should live our lives as if and look forward to um, his return. It would be, uh, that would be the best thing that could possibly happen. And so uh, he was hoping he would be alive and on the earth um, so that he wouldn't have to go through the experience of death. And um, I would guess I can get an amen from everybody in here. It would be fantastic. You know what? And we've seen it, you know, when I was talking about Patrick. Um, you know what? Death is the final enemy. If we did not have to go through death, man, if we could just go be with Jesus. And we are. Um, but for now, um, for most of us, that will be the final experience of our alive state. But keep in mind, the best is yet to come. Um, so the glorified body is called a building of God and a house not made with hands in 2 Corinthians 5.1 and our house which is from heaven in 2 Corinthians 5.2. Um, this is a contrast to the mortal bodies which came from the dust of the earth. And as we have borne the image of the earthly body, we also bear the image of the heavenly body, 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And so I had said earlier, 1 Corinthians 15 has quite a lot to say about this. Uh, so, again, Paul wasn't groaning um, because he was in a human body, but because he longed to go see Jesus. Um, and we get this throughout Paul's letters. Paul was not afraid of death. Um, I believe we're not to be afraid of death either, um, certainly as believers. Um, if you are not a follower of Christ, you have every right, honestly, um, and you would be quite wise to, to be afraid of death. But we don't and shouldn't, and Paul didn't. Um, he called his death a departure in 2 Timothy 4.6. And... So how can we be sure that we shall one day have new bodies like the glorified body of our Savior? And the reason we can be sure is because the Spirit lives within us. And it says in that passage that um, the Holy Spirit had been left with us as a guarantee. Um, the Holy Spirit dwelling in the believer's body is the down payment that guarantees the future inheritance. You know what? If, God, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, we would not. I mean, we know um, what this looks like. Death is the final enemy. There's an, it's really hard to put a bow on death. But God, Jesus clearly overcame death. And because of that, so shall we. And the Holy Spirit was given to us as a, as a guarantee of that. Um, so he talks about, in verses 6 through 8, he talks about uh, being always confident um, so the people of God are in one of two places right now. They are either in heaven or they're on earth. Um, none of them is in the grave. Body, yes. Spirit, no. Um, none of them is in hell or any intermediate place between heaven and earth. Um, Jesus, thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, believers on earth are at home in the body, while believers who have died are absent from the body, uh, but with Christ. Believers on earth are absent from the Lord, while believers in heaven are present with the Lord. Uh, because he had this kind of confidence, Paul wasn't, wasn't afraid of suffering or trials um, or even the dangers. And Paul um, recounts all the things he had been through. You know, sometimes we think, um, sometimes I personally think, you know, my life's been, been kind of rough and... Um, you don't know this, but uh, the day before Thanksgiving last year, I had a um, an accident while I was cutting wood, and I fractured ribs. And it's been over two months, two and a half months now, and they still hurt. It still hurts. It hurts to breathe. Every time I take in a breath, it hurts to breathe. I, I don't even understand why it should still hurt after all this time, but it does. Um... I don't 
I don't cry and almost pass out when I sneeze anymore. There was a time I did. A long time I did. Um, coughing, um, the things, some of the things we take for granted. So sometimes I get caught up on, man, my earthly body, it is breaking down. Um, in my studies of this, I was reading that at the age of 30, so if you're beyond 30, your body is breaking down. Um, so it, it is just what comes along with it. So, but Paul, when you look at his life, I mean, he was beat, he was left for dead, he was, uh, he was flogged more than one time, um, one less than the maximum, shipwrecked a couple of times. I mean, Paul, he definitely knew what he was um, talking about and when he, um, talking about trials and dangers. So the thing about Paul was he, he trusted God. Clearly, he says he does, but Paul didn't take unnecessary chances. I mean, Paul wasn't going to jump off of a building to see how it was going to land, but he also wasn't going to uh, turn back from doing what he thought God wanted him to do. So he wasn't, he wasn't going to risk his life foolishly, but he would had no problem um, with losing his life for the sake of Christ and the ministry of the gospel. So he walked by faith and not by sight. Um, we saw that also um, in the previous chapter. Heaven wasn't simply a destination for Paul, but it was his motivation for living. He knew um, that what was to come was better. So um, we just recently finished a, a study in Hebrews. And uh, in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, the heroes of the faith looked to um, the heavenly city and they lived their lives in view of what was to come. And I believe we are supposed to do that as well. So as we review this section in 2 Corinthians, we can see how Paul had the courage um, and he wouldn't lose heart. He had an incredible ministry um, that transformed lives. He had that treasure in jars of clay um, and he wanted to share the treasure with a bankrupt world. That's what we're supposed to do as well. Um, he had faith that conquered fear, and his future hope was that he had both a destination, but it also motivated him. Um, no wonder Paul um, said in Romans 8.37 that we are more than conquerors. Um, so every believer in Jesus Christ has these same possessions and can find them and courage for the, con for the conflict. Um, Calvin commented, um, true faith begets not merely contempt for death, but desire for it. And thus it is a sign of unbelief in us when the fear of death is stronger than the joy and comfort of hope. I find that really convicting. Um, I, I absolutely, as I get older, I think more about death. Um, and it's not a warm, fuzzy feeling that I have when I think about it. Um, but I, I found Calvin's, uh, comments. Pretty, uh, pretty convicting. Uh, let me say it again. It is a sign of unbelief in us when the fear of death is stronger than the joy and com comfort of hope. So I hope as we uh, um, are beginning to transition out of this that, uh, that you have, that you understood Paul um, and his awaiting the new body. It is good news. It was always meant to be good news. So um, Paul's account encounters with death and constant suffering, his progressive physical weakness as he um, got older and just the, um, the rigors of everything that he went through um, prompted him to reflect on the nature of death for Christians. So he had given us, and as I kind of wrap up this part of it, I want you to remember these things. He specified three sources of divine comfort available to believers who face death. Um, number one, and this is a big one, they will certainly, you will certainly possess a heavenly body. Number two, you presently possess the spirit of God's pledge of a resurrection trans transformation. 
you presently possess the spirit of God's pledge of a resurrection transformation. And then finally, death, while nobody probably really looks forward to it, um, means departing into Christ's immediate presence. The last breath you take here, um, the next moment you'll be with Jesus. And I believe that is something that we can, we can all look forward to. So what we believe and how we believe as we um, start moving towards the next section um, kind of goes together. You act the way you act because of what you believe. Um, Paul, pretty consistently in Scripture, connected doctrine, connected something he was trying to teach with a duty, something that we were to do. Um, because what because of what God has done for us, we have an obligation, um, and we should be motivated to do something for Him. Um, there is a, a few therefores in this passage of Scripture. Um, therefores. In a lot of ways, that was Paul's way of using, this is what I just taught you, therefore, um, this is how you should act. Um, and so, Paul moved from explanation to application, and his theme was motivation for ministry. So, Paul's enemies had accused him of using the ministry of the gospel for his own selfish purposes. Patrick's taught you that before. Um, when in reality, they were the ones who were actually doing that. Um, we don't see that at all in present day where I accuse you of doing something that I'm actually doing. So that's a whole nother, whole nother ball of wax there. Um, and so, but what is the ministry for Christians? It's to pers it is, our job is to persuade sinners to be reconciled to God. Um, we can't force people to trust Christ. Um, we should not try to... Um, this is probably a bit of an indictment on most of the modern church, but um, we should not try to entertain them into the kingdom. Um, you know what, I certainly have been at churches that have pretty fantastic light shows and uh, pretty, you know, pretty fantastic worship service and then essentially a devotion. That is not what church is supposed to be. That is not how we are supposed to, um, we are supposed to teach God's word. And I believe we do that. Um, I certainly know Patrick does it. I, I know that that is the desire of the elders as well. So we are to persuade them, but we're not to, um, we can't force them and we're not to, to trick them, as it were. Um, we don't need to do that. First Thessalonians 2.3 says, Our message to you is true, our motives are pure, our conduct is absolutely above board. Um, so the Christian worker must have the right motive for ministry as well as the right message. And so um, he begins... And this is kind of at the tail end of this section that I just read. Um, so I'm not going to read the next section yet because they do tie together. Um, keep in mind that when all this was done, it was one letter. And we people, humans, not inspired, have gone in and put the heading. So um, in verse 9, um, he talks about laboring. And so... Um, When we think of ambition, um, we tend to think of it at, not in a good way. Um, but ambition, um, there certainly can be holy ambition. Um, and that is what we are, um, that's what Paul was able to do. Um, and I believe it is, is our challenge as well. Uh, Paul's great ambition was to please Jesus. So you had the Judaizers out there who were... Um, trying to please uh, men. And so this idea of people-pleasing versus God-pleasing. Um, I had uh, shared with uh, um, a couple here last week 
last Sunday after service. Um, you know what? I, I, I wish I was less of a people pleaser. I, I like being liked. I said that in my elder meditation. I don't, I like being liked. I wish that wasn't me. I wish, um, and I think Paul challenges us here in that passage to, um, you know what? I need to please Jesus, period. That's, that needs to be my focus. Um, if that pleases people in at the same time, then that's all well and good. But a lot of times I believe that they are, um, they are counter to each other. So, um, and one of the things, you know, Romans 12, 1, how do we pre please God is by offering our bodies as living sacrifices. And when we live our lives so as to help others, um, one of the things in ministry I've always been concerned about, particularly as it relates to youth, is not doing something that causes somebody to stumble. I don't use my liberty as a Christian. That comes from um, Romans chapter 14, verses 18. Um, so God is pleased with us when we can, when we can avoid the evil around us, um, he is pleased when, when we do what he tells us to do. This is, a lot of this is obedience. Um, there is nothing wrong with godly ambition. Um, Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 20, um, so I have strived, so I've been ambitious to preach the gospel. And that was his testimony. So it was his godly ambition to do so. Um, verse 10 about this appearing before the Lord. This is a pretty important, um, sometimes I think it gets lost in what comes before it and what comes after this, um, this appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, because of time, I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time here. Um, this is not the what's known as the great white throne judgment, but everyone will... Um, stand before Jesus and have our lives. And it's, um, I don't think it's, um, I don't think we're like going to get picked to death for all the, you know, every single bad thing we did. Um, but I do believe that, uh, and I think this passage and those related to it are fairly clear that um, we, there is a judgment coming even for believers where God is going to, to look at how we lived our lives and we'll be rewarded or not rewarded. Um, so not punishment necessarily, but uh, rewarded for how we lived our lives. And so that should be motivation for us um, is kind of the big thing from, for me on that, is it should be motivation for us to live our lives as, in such a way. And it's Paul's goal to live a, his life in such a way that he would not be um, ashamed when he stood before God to give an account of his life. And so I believe it should be with, with us as well. So um, let me pick it up with verse 11. Uh, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. I hope it is known also to your conscience. Um, we are not commending ourselves to you again but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, there's one of those therefores, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the, the message of reconciliation. 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And you just heard that in um, Union Meditation. Uh, Ron did a great job with that. And I'll be coming back to that. Um, it is um, one of the foundational um, verses in all of Scripture, in my opinion. So, um, so there is a lot here. This section that's titled um, in the Bible, the Ministry of Reconciliation. Um, I would argue, and I guess I am arguing, um, that what we need more than anything in the world is reconciliation with God. Um, if I could sum this up, and I am definitely going to spend some time going into this, um, but if I could sum this up, <clears throat> we, we need to be reconciled with God more than we need anything else. Uh, we had a big problem, um, which he references um, because of Adam's sin. Uh, we have a gigantic problem as the enemies of God. And so more than anything, um, you could argue that, you know, salvation and all that, that is, we need a savior, all that stuff. But that all of that is um, part of this idea of reconciliation. So um, talking about, uh, he begins to start, um, we persuade others, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord. Um, let me talk just a moment about the fear of the Lord. Um, when, we, um, when we think of the fear of the Lord, this is not uh, you know, just an absolute terror. Um, we're not to live our lives this way, but this has to do with a healthy respect for God's holiness um, if I think about God's holiness for very long, um, I and and I think about myself for very long, um, I understand full well that I need to have a healthy respect. Uh, so this idea of uh, fear of the Lord, but this fear of the Lord is what wants us um, to persuade others. That is... Um, That is why we we do it. Um, so when he's talking about fear, it, it doesn't mean fright or dread or horror. Um, after all, as we just learned, we're going to see our Savior, and we know that he loves us. Um, Ron handled that well in his communion meditation as well. Um, but Paul also wasn't one to minimize the awesomeness of uh, of God and the reverence for which, um, and this idea that we shall stand before Christ, and he is no respecter of persons. Um, so he has commanded us to spread the gospel to all nations, and we are to be obedient for doing that. Um, so how do we prepare for that judgment seat? So another one is to live lives so that, uh, um, that we are ready for that. So, the love of Christ. Um, so, how, how is it possible that these opposite emotions of fear and love dwell in the same part? Um, certainly, I mean, if you think about children, children get it. Um, they absolutely love their parents, yet they respect them authority, or at least they should. They better, right? Or they'll find out. I mean, it's... Um, so we do see this um, in, in aspects of our life, certainly as it relates to raising children. Uh, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, Psalm 211. So this idea of the love of Christ means his love for us is seen in his sacrificial death. That is really how we know it is the ultimate um, showing of his love for us was his sacrificial death. And then in 1 John 
4.19, we're told, we love him because he first loved us. Um, he loved us when we were unlovely, a really important point. Um, in fact, he loved us when we were ungodly sinners and enemies. Um, you have this passage in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Uh, Romans 5, 8 is one of my favorites to use. Um, this, it wasn't when um, we were believers. It was, I mean, Christ died for us when we were his enemies. He, I mean, he died for his enemies. So when he died on the cross, he proved his love for, for us. Uh, and when you consider the reasons why he died, you can't help but love him back. He also talks in this passage about um, because he died that we die also. Um, this idea of then all died. Uh, Romans 6 actually handles this really well. I don't have time really to go into to that part of it. But um, when Christ died, we died with him. Um, we died in him and we died with him. Therefore, the old life should have no hold on us today. Um, Galatians 2.20, um, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Um, and then also he died that we might live. This is the positive aspect of, the, of our identification with Christ. Um, we not only died with him, but we are also raised with him that we might walk in newness of life. And that's, you hear that a lot at baptisms. Raised to walk in newness of life. And I love that idea from uh, Romans 6, 4. Um, because we've died with Christ, we can overcome sin. And because we live with Christ, um, we can be fruit bearers, which um, we are called to do for God's glory, Romans 7, 4. Um, so God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him, 1 John 4, 9. Um, this is the experience of salvation, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. But he also died that we might live for him and not live for ourselves. And that's hard for us humans to do sometimes. Um, one of the things I read put it this way, Christ died our death for us so that we might live his life for him. So Christ died our death for us that we might live his life for him. So the commission of Christ, verses 18 through 21, as I wrap this up. Um, the key idea in this is the reconciliation, which is where this whole thing got its heading from. Um, so because of our rebellion, um, we are enemies of God, and it, we have, it's broken our fellowship with him. Through the work of the cross, Jesus Christ has brought man and God together again. He's reconciled and has turned his face in love toward us and the lost world. Um, the base, basic meaning of the word reconcile is to change thoroughly. Um, it refers to a changed relationship between God and the lost world. Um, so God doesn't have to be reconciled to man. It's the other way around. God did this, but it's us that needs to be um, reconciled. It's a really important point there. One other thing, it's pretty hard to get through this um, without... It's the idea of imputation, which is a, a, a theological word. Um, imputation actually comes from the banking industry, and I, I really had forgotten that. Um, and it simply means to put it to one's account. So when you deposit money in the bank, um, the clerk, or nowadays the computer, uh, puts that amount to your account and to your credit. So when Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins were imputed to him, put to his account. Ron was talking about this as well. Um, so all of our sins were imputed to him. They were put to his account. Uh, he was treated by God as though he had actually committed those sins. The result, all of those sins have been paid for, and God no longer holds them against us. Because we've trusted Christ as our Savior, um, but even more, God has put to our account the very righteousness of Christ. This is the best part of that. The idea that all of our sins were imputed to Christ is huge. 
and he paid the penalty for those. Now when God sees us, he does not see us as, he does not see our sin. But the best part of that arguably really is Christ's imputed righteousness that we didn't deserve being put to our account so that when he sees us, he sees us as righteous. And again, this is something that um, we are not righteous. He sees us as something that we will be. And that's pretty exciting. Um, it's no wonder that Calvin referred to this as the wonderful exchange. I think when I've used this before, uh, 521, uh, particularly this, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is, there is no better verse in all of scripture, in my opinion, um, that, that gives you the gospel. Um, and so I think when I've used this as a communion meditation before, I referred to it as the great exchange. That's what Luther called it. Um, Calvin in his institutes um, referred to it as the wonderful exchange. So uh, in wrapping this up, and I promise I'm about done, Second Corinthians 5.21 um, I want to go through just just to make sure, just to give you, um, make sure you get this. So, uh, for our sake, this is purely out of God's grace. For our sake, um, God did this for the for us. Um, so, in light of our need and prompted by His goodness, now for our sake, He, who is the Father, made Him, who is Jesus, to be sin. Um, not sinful, um, Jesus never was sinful, but counted as a sinner, um, indeed to be counted as, as the focal point of all the accumulated sins um, of all the people who believe on him in human history. Who knew no sin, um, that's where you get the idea. He did not become a sinner. Um, our sin was imputed to him. He was fully righteous. So who knew no sin, um, he lived the only flawless life. There was zero sin in him, which is why he was the perfect sacrifice. It goes on to say, so that in him, so this uh, being united with Christ, that we might become the righteousness of God. So in other words, having to do again with um, the, this perfect righteousness um, that we will have for all of eternity, um, which is counted to us solely through um, our faith. And we are not only acquitted, um, but positively righteous in the sight of God. And that is a great place to leave it. And so I believe that is where I am going to end this for now. So... Um, I hope you learned that seemed a little disjointed even to me. Um, I Sometimes I overstudy. I have too much information and the stuff that I was flying through. So, um, But I hope you got something out of that passage of Scripture. Um, I hope it will prompt you to dig into it and learn um, even more. So um, let me close with a word of prayer, and then we will um, get ready, um, those of you that um, want to leave and go get a snack or welcome to do that. Um, I'll ask uh, Larry and any of the other elders that are in here want to make their way forward. If anybody would like to, to stay and be prayed for again, we would love to do that. So God, thank you for your word. Um, God, thank you for um, the opportunity to study it. And God, I hope that uh, I hope that those out there were able to um, to gain something from it um, would lift up the message for second service as well. God, thanks for each of the people out there, God, as we, uh, uh, as we go about our day. Um, help us to remember that uh, um, our goal is to please you. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.